everybody tells you that you need to invest your money. But nobody ever actually tells you how to do it once you've gotten your paycheck. Well, that's why in today's video, I'm gonna go over for you the most optimal way to invest your money once you've actually gotten paid. Number one, and this is the first account you should invest in once you've gotten paid, that is an emergency fund. And I know, I know, some of you are thinking right now, that's not investing, that's just a savings account. Yes, it is in fact a savings account, but riddle me this. Let's say you did not have an emergency fund set up and suddenly you're driving home, your car has a mechanical issue, and now you have to come out of pocket $1,000. Well, if you have no money set aside and all of your money is tied up in other places, how are you going to be able to pay for that $1,000 emergency? Well, maybe you might have to sell some stocks. Maybe you have to go borrow some more money, which in the long term will only set you back. Whereas if you had an emergency fund set up, you could pull from that bank to cover you so that you don't have to deplete your resources from other investments. Because at the end of the day, none of us know what life is gonna throw at us, whether it be some sort of medical emergency, a mechanical breakdown, but by having an emergency fund, we have a blanket to protect the rest of our investments. And as for how much to have in an emergency fund, there are guidelines that say you'd have anywhere from three to six, even upwards of 12 months. But the most important thing is build up one month of emergency fund as soon as possible. And once you have the one month built up, I personally wouldn't contribute as aggressively, though I would still keep building that emergency fund, but then I would be able to start funding some of the downstream accounts we'll talk about later in this video. And as for where you should be keeping your emergency fund, I personally recommend having it in a high yield savings account. Right now, these things are paying upwards of four, even 5%, which means your money is making you more money while you don't do anything. You can also keep it in a checking account, but keep in mind, most checking accounts are paying zero, 0.1%. 0 and if this is money that you're not touching on the regular, I'd much rather have it get more interest. And if you're interested in a high yield savings account, here are my top recommendations up here. Account number two. So once you have an emergency fund squared away, now you want to focus on maximizing your employer match. To me, the beauty of maximizing the employer match into a employer-sponsored retirement account, such as a 401k or 403b, is that, and I think I can say this confidently, it's the only investment in which you're gonna get a 100% return on your money. For example, when I used to work corporate, I would often have an employer match where they would match me dollar for dollar up to 6% of my contributions. So if I'm putting in 6%, my employer puts in another 6%, that's a 100% return on my money. And so you wanna make sure you are maximizing your contribution to get the full match. No and, if, or buts about it. And as for what type of account you put this in, you don't have much of a choice. It's just gonna be whatever your employer has. However, if there are certain funds in there that have really high fees or there's certain funds in there that's not available, I recommend you reach out to your HR business partner or your benefits administrator to see if you can get some more competitive funds added into your overall employer-sponsored retirement accounts. The third place you should be investing your money. After you've gotten your employer match, now we're gonna tackle debt, specifically high interest debt. For a lot of people, that's gonna look like things like credit card debt. For some, it could even be student loans, depending on when you got them. Paying down high interest debt is one of the best ways you could do to invest your money. Because quite literally, if we look at a credit card, they could have interest rates going anywhere from 18 up to 28%. That is doing you no favor. In fact, to me, that is like an anchor, a financial anchor that's dragging you down month over month, year over year. And so the focus really is to get that down as quick as possible. And there's a couple methods that we can use to approach this. You can either look at using the debt avalanche approach or the debt snowball approach. So with the debt snowball approach, what you would first do is take a look at the smallest balance that you have on some sort of high interest debt and pay that off. And then you go to the next biggest and next biggest. And you build that momentum kind of like a snowball. The other approach, the debt avalanche approach, what you would do is take a look at the highest interest rate first, regardless of the balance, and get that paid off first because at the end of the day, that interest is really what's keeping you down. And then you go on to the account with the next highest interest, next highest interest, and so forth. In addition to those payoff methods, another thing you can do to kind of juggle the ball a little bit is actually look at 0% APR cards, specifically 0% promotional APR balance transfer card, where you take a credit card with a really high interest and balance and transfer it to a credit card with no interest for a promotional period of time, typically anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Now, in the 18 to 24 months though, pay it off aggressively. The other thing you wanna note about those type of cards is they're usually gonna be a fee to do the balance transfer, but depending on how big your balance is and what the interest is you're already paying on the credit card debt, it could be worthwhile. Account number four. With the high interest rate debt squared away, the next account we're gonna look into is a health savings account or HSA. And this is probably one of my 
favorite accounts on the entire list. Why? Well, quite simply, it is the only account available to you where the money that you put in there is triple tax advantage. Now, what does triple tax advantage mean? Well, the money that goes in is not taxed. The money in an HSA that is invested will grow tax-free. And then when you withdraw that money for a qualified medical expense, you don't pay any taxes on it. And the HSA limit for 2024 at least for a single individual is $4,150. And for a family is $8,800. And to be eligible to contribute into an HSA, you have to have a shitty healthcare plan. Basically a very high deductible healthcare plan, which unfortunately, at least for as long as I was working in corporate America, that's always what I had and probably a lot of you out there as well. And so you most likely can contribute to one. And keep in mind, once you put money into an HSA, you still have to then pick investments. Otherwise it's just going to sit there. And once your investments are picked within an HSA account, you don't want to touch it. And I know you probably think that's a little bit weird because how are you going to use the money for medical expenses? Well, here's where actually it gets really, really interesting. With an HSA, there is no time limit as to when you can apply for reimbursement. So here's what I mean by that. Let's say you go to a doctor and you have a copay due of $100. You can either use your HSA card, swipe it and pay the $100, or you can pay the $100 just out of pocket and keep that receipt. And then in five, 10, 15, 20 years, file for reimbursement and then pay with $100 then. And the difference is you've allowed that $100, instead of just coming out of your HSA account directly, it's grown and compounded. And assuming you invested into a low cost broad based market index fund that returns anywhere from eight to 10% a year, that $100 is gonna be worth considerably more in 10, 15, 20 years. Of course, you have to have the financial means in order to do it and pay out of pocket. But if you can, this is probably one of my favorite hacks for the HSA. Moving on to number five, after you've maxed out your HSA, now we want to look to maximize our retirement accounts. This can be individual retirement accounts or your employer sponsored retirement accounts like a 401k or 403b. The biggest advantage your money has when it's invested into a retirement account are the tax advantages. Either you're going to be able to defer taxes and reduce your current year tax liability, or the money you put in there is going to be able to grow entirely tax free because you've already paid taxes before it was put in there. You do want to be wary that there are contribution limits. However, Ever, if you don't contribute up to the limit every year, it does not roll over. So this year in 2024, the IRA contribution limit for those under the age of 50 is $7,000. If you contributed $3,000 into your IRA, it does not mean in 2025, you have an additional $4,000 to contribute. You're still gonna be at the max for 2025, whatever the IRS determines. So keep that in mind. It's either a use it or lose it type of contribution. And with retirement accounts, there is a bit of a decision you need to make as to whether or not you want to contribute into a traditional IRA or traditional 401k or a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k. The difference being a traditional type of retirement account is tax deferred, meaning you do not pay taxes now. It reduces your current year tax liability, but you will pay taxes when you withdraw it in retirement. Whereas with a Roth option, you are going to be putting money that has already been taxed into the retirement account. So therefore, when you withdraw it in retirement, you won't pay taxes on it. In the general school of thought is if you think you're going to be in a lower tax bracket now, but a higher tax bracket in retirement, you should contribute aggressively into a Roth type of account. Whereas if you're in a high tax bracket now, and you think you're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement, you should contribute to a traditional retirement account. Though personally, I actually do lean a little bit more towards a traditional 401k, just because I can reduce my current year tax liability, which is a guarantee. And I don't really know what the tax brackets are going to look like in 20, 30 or 40 years. However, for those who are higher earners, like you are in the highest tax bracket possible. Contributing to a traditional IRA slash 401k probably makes the most sense because you're likely not going to withdraw that much more money in retirement unless you're really looking to fat fire. And with 401ks and 403bs, you're limited by where your company has those accounts. Whereas for a IRA that you open, you're going to be able to choose amongst a plethora. I personally recommend Schwab, Vanguard, or Fidelity. They're the big three in the space and you can't go wrong with any of them. Now we move on to number six. After you've maxed out your retirement account, we should start looking at medium interest rate debt. This would be for things like auto loans. This would be for things like student loans. Very similar to the high interest rate debt, 
any sort of debt with interest is going to act like a financial anchor. It is going to weigh you down. Now, this might not actually drag you back under the water, but it's certainly not letting you spread your wings and fly. It is still going to be there. And so you want to be cognizant that you are paying this off. The decision criteria I want people to consider here is what's the opportunity cost? What is the actual interest rate of this debt? If it's in the five, six, seven percent range, while money that you invest in the stock market can return anywhere from eight to 10%, you then wanna factor in how aggressively you wanna take down the medium interest rate debt. However, if it's similar or slightly higher, I would probably tilt towards the option of paying that off more aggressively than focusing on investing elsewhere. Number seven, once you've had a plan in place for your medium interest rate debt, now you can go ahead and move to investing your money in just a regular old brokerage account. And you probably are surprised that this is one of the later options where you should be investing your money. But the reason being, these regular brokerage accounts are very tax inefficient. And I know oftentimes when we Google how to start investing, we get plenty of articles and videos that say, go ahead, take $100, open a Robinhood account, fund it, and then just you're off to the races. But that's actually the worst thing you can do if you haven't already maximized all of the other accounts we've discussed earlier, because those are not only generating you a quote unquote greater return, but also they're tax efficient. That's the biggest thing. In terms of like making money, get a better job. In terms of investing and keeping a lot of money, you wanna be very tax conscious of what that looks like. And when it comes to investing in taxable accounts, I'm gonna be very real with you. If you're early in your career, if you're in your 20s, even 30s, low cost, broad based market index funds. Things like VTI, the entire stock market, VOO, which tracks the S&P 500, VXUS, which tracks everything besides the US looking at internationals. These are the tried and true methods for investing. I kid you not. I know it's gonna seem so sexy to try to come in and read some charts to beat the market. You can't do it. I can't do it. Trust me, if you want to be a successful investor, if you actually want to end up wealthy in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, low cost, broad based market index funds and sit on your hands. That is the way. Sure, if you are a high income earner and you just got an itch that you have to scratch, go do your YOLO meme stonks all day. But for the majority of your portfolio, I'm talking 95, 98% low cost, broad based market index funds. And if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. But this is also what Warren Buffett recommends to the majority of people. Yeah, the guy who's a billionaire who's made his billions on picking individual stocks has pretty much said, unless you're me, which most of us are not, in fact, nobody is, low cost, broad based market index funds. And as far as what type of accounts to open, I also recommend a Schwab, a Vanguard, or Fidelity. Stay away from like the Robin Hoods with the flashy UIs because those apps, make money every single time you make a trade. Their incentive is to get you to click buttons and buy and sell, buy and sell. The fastest way to lose money is to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. Pick the apps that have unsexy UIs because again, the secret to investing is put the money in, watch it grow, don't touch it, you're wealthy. It's not YOLO meme stonk, up, down, in, out. No, it's none of that, trust me. And number eight, last but certainly not least, these are your low interest rate debts. And the one that sticks out for most people is your mortgage. The reason this is high is most mortgages don't have an interest rate that's that crazy. Now, recently mortgage interest rates have spiked five, six, seven percent Prior to the last year or two, the majority of people have mortgage interest rates that bounce from two, two and a half to upwards of 4%. And the reason it's not a priority is because if you think about it, if you have something that's charging you a 2% interest, but you have an investment opportunity that could return you 8%, well, it would be reasonable to put extra money into the investment versus paying off the interest because you'd be making money on just the spread. And that's why most people are not aggressively paying down your mortgage. Now, if you have a mortgage interest rate for whatever reason of eight, nine, 10%, then that's not low interest, that's medium interest, and absolutely that's a higher priority. But for most people, the optimal thing to do is actually just pay your low interest rate debt at the rate that it's at and investing the difference, unless you just really want to get rid of it. And that's totally fine. And if you do want to get rid of interest quickly, one thing you can actually do is try to make bi-weekly payments. If you make bi-weekly payments, you actually are able to squeeze out 13 months of payments in a year instead of 12 months, which you would do by just making regular monthly payments. And by just paying one extra month a year, you could be finished with your mortgage 
five, six, seven years early. Depending on what your interest rates are, you could save tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's the video, folks. This is the most optimal order to invest your money once you've gotten that paycheck. Now, let me know if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions in the box down below. And as always, if you wanna support my channel, I do have some affiliate as well as referral links for things like high yield savings accounts in the description box down there as well. And I'll catch you on the next video. Peace.